technology. We're building tomorrow's memories today, right here on NBC. First off, it's baseball on NBC, and today you'll see the San Diego Padres in a rematch of last year's National League Championship Series take on the Chicago Cubs. Or the Cubs' rivals in the National League East, the New York Mets, against Pete Rose in pursuit of Ty Cobb's record and the young Cincinnati Reds. Then after baseball, NBC's Golf Tour 85 continues with golf's greatest names in the Tournament of Champions. Tom Watson defends his title live from La Costa. But up first, NBC Sports presents Major League Baseball. An inside look at baseball and a preview of today's Game of the Week. Brought to you by Light Beer from Miller. Everything you've always wanted in a beer and less. And by Honda Motorcycles. Honda, follow the leader. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill McAtee here in our NBC Sports studios in New York, and we want to get quickly to a story that has broken this morning. The San Diego Union reported today that Alan Wiggins, the second baseman for the San Diego Padres, who has entered a drug rehabilitation facility, will not play again for the Padres this year. The team thus far has refused comment, but Padres Club President Ballard Smith has called a press conference for 6 o'clock Eastern time to discuss the situation. Now, yesterday, for the first time since the National League playoffs last year, the Padres played the Cubs. And San Diego won by a score of 6-5. to five. Padres scored three runs in the first, two coming here on this triple into the gap in right center. Tim Flannery and Tony Gwynn score. Craig Nettles and Gary Templeton both homered for the Padres later on. They win 6-5. Rick Sutcliffe was the loser. His first loss at Wrigley Field, Sutcliffe 3-3. Three three. And the Twins had their winning streak snapped last night. The Twins had won 10 straight, but with the score tied in the eighth against Baltimore, Cal Ripken hit his fourth home run of the year. A two-run shot. That stood up. The Orioles beat the Twins by a score of 8-7. Well, the pressures created by victory. We'll talk of that and take a lyrical look at the Yankee managers. That and a few surprises when we come back to New York in a moment. We just found out the team. The fifth game of the 1984 National League Championship Series. It was the bursting of the Cubs' bubble. They led the Padres two games to none and let it slip away. They lost three straight, the third after leading with their ace, Rick Sutcliffe, on the mound. For the Cubs, it was devastating. As the offseason wore on, did you think about the game? Did you think yeah. about specific sure. plays? You did, huh? Sure, you can. You can't get away from it. I mean, in this business, you think about things like that. The importance of of winning a National League pennant and getting in a World Series with a chance to win the World Championship is that's what we're all after and then you can't just walk away from a thing like that and forget about it. So while the team thought about losing during the offseason, their fans thought about winning. And next year, Cubs mania is alive and well here in Chicago. For the first time, we had lines of people waiting to buy a season ticket. Where in the past, there was always a base of maybe three to 6,000 season tickets for the whole year. But we had three or 6,000 people waiting outside some cold December morning waiting for the gates to open so they could purchase their seats. The first game we had this spring, we had standing room only crowd in Mesa, Arizona. The people were lined up at 7 in the morning to buy standing room seats. It was an incredible thing for spring training. They really seemed to enjoy the fact that we were, we were winners finally that uh, they, as Cub fans, could hold their heads up and, and uh, root like the devil and be very proud of their team. It's a very positive atmosphere in Chicago. It's gone crazy. What should happen first, you thought, if you guys don't win this year? Well, there's always next year. Well, what about this year? The Cubs signed all of their free agent pitchers, so the club is pretty much intact. We got everybody back from last year. Uh, the main concern over the winter was signing the three starting pitchers who were free agents, and uh, Dallas Green did that. So, uh, you know, all the ingredients are, are there to uh, repeat and uh, maybe go a little bit further. One major change, veteran Larry Boa replaced the shortstop by rookie Sean Dunstan. Well, they talk about just repeating and going to the playoffs and changing what happened last year. So um, I think they have a good shot at it. It was 1984 a fluke. And we're out to prove that it wasn't a fluke, that uh, we have a good baseball team, and that we can win in 1985. And the Cubs hope they'll get another shot at the Padres. That's why tickets were scalped for their first spring training meeting, and why this weekend's games are sold out at Wrigley. And the Cubs fans want to replace that memory of last year's Tiger World Series, which featured the Padres dancing their way to a five-game defeat. One fascinating footnote, many Cubs fans did not cash in their World Series tickets, pouring thousands of dollars into the Cubs' coffers. 
So in a way, Cubs fans have helped finance the signing of their players. Not making the World Series last year may actually help them make it this time. Len Berman at Wrigley Field. You know, some wondered about the Mets, the Cubs, and the Padres this year, but all three are out quickly. The Padres have the lead in the West. The Mets and the Cubs are tied for the lead in the East. We have the managers of the latter clubs with us now. Davey Johnson of the Mets is in Cincinnati. Jim Fry of the Cubs is in Chicago. This is a different kind of season. You both had a chance to sneak up on some folks last year. Certainly that has changed uh, a little bit this year. And we'll start with you, Jim. I want both of you to answer this question. Some teams perform better in the spotlight. Uh, others do not. Jim, where is your club most comfortable? Well, I, I, as far as sneaking up on people, let me answer it that way. I don't think we snuck up on anybody. By the All-Star break last year, everybody knew we had a good ball club. I don't think anybody allowed us to win the thing last year. So we can discount that kind of stuff. As far as how good we think we're going to be able to play, I think we're going to be able to play good. I know that the Mets have been called the favorites by most of the media, but I'm going to discount that also. Okay, Davey? Well, I've been hearing that uh, the Cubs are the favorite, but last year was, uh, <laughs> as far as being a surprise last year, I agree with Jimmy. I don't think we sneak up on anybody in the National League. And uh, as far as being a favorite to win a division, I think that's very nice. I've always liked to be on teams that were considered good and uh, leaving it up to us to go prove it. How about the individual pressure? You both play in media centers. The media sometimes tends to overstate the good and the bad. Do you feel any added pressure this year? Jimmy? I certainly don't. Well, I tell you the truth uh, everybody talks about high expectations by the fans and the media I think we have high expectations for our ball club at least I do I know we've got good pitching I know we've got good hitting I think if we just mind our own business and forget about the media and the fans and just play our game that we're capable of playing I expect that we're going to play very well pretty good rivalry between these two clubs are the players into it as much as the fans seem to be Davey well, I, we certainly are. You know, this year we've got something to prove against the Cubs because last year they beat us uh, quite handily. But we feel, you know, with a young staff, we're much improved. We've had another year in the league, and uh, we think we can compete with the Cubs this year. Dave, you got enough pitching to carry you down the stretch? Well, you know, we've been kind of crippled with some injuries here lately, but we're still holding our own, and we've got a fine crop of young pitchers not only here but in Tidewater. So, you know, if I don't mess up too bad, I think we can compete <laughs> with Jimmy and his Cubs. Also, it has to help a little bit when the front office makes the commitment to keep winning the Cubs signing free agents on the pitching staff and Mets bringing in Gary Carter from Montreal. Thank you both very much. Carter, by the way, uh, cracked the rib last week, but he is already back in Davey Johnson's lineup. And we'll be back right after this. A musical inspiration for a songwriter named Dick McCormick. Come all you good Yankee fans, here is the game. What you wish among us remembers the names of the managers who the pinstripes inspired. The guys that George Steinbrenner hired and fired. Ralph Houck was the major of the old regime, but Burton made sure the Yanks looked like Marines. With their hair nice and short and their chins nice and clean, then came Billy Martin, the brawler supreme. Martin, quote, quit, quote, in 78, replaced by Bob Lemon, whose speedball was great, but in less than a year met a similar fate. But Martin returned Reggie Jackson to hate. From Ralph Houck to Jerry Burden, from Burden to Martin, from Martin to Lemon, the world knows as Lem back to Martin to Hauser, to Michael and then to Bob Lemon again, to Gene Michael again. To Clyde King, to Billy Martin again, to Yogi Berra again, back to Martin again. Martin said, by George, I'll eat marshmallows no more. Dick Hauser showed us what tough guys are for, just to take care of business guys. That was Dick, but he ended up on the wrong end of the stick. Then a year later, George showed Gene Michael the door, with Len saying, haven't I been here before? Then they reversed it to give me and you a disquieting feeling of deja vu. Hating George became the new national sport. Clyde King had a reign that was dreadfully short. And then the Bronx Bombers got ready to blow. When a third time Steinbrenner said, play Billy Ball. From Ralph Huck to Bill Burton, from Burton to Martin, from Martin to Lemon, the world knows his love, but to Mark Dowser and Michael and then to Bob Lemon again, to Gene Michael again, to Clyde King, to Billy Martin again, to Yogi Berra again, back to Martin again. Billy Ball seemed to detract from the game, so they brought Yogi back from the Hall of Fame with his very strange phrases and very busy news. 
and the pledge of a job till the end of this year. And now even Yogi's had one game too many. And here comes George Steinbrenner's favorite bad penny. Throughout the whole world, the betting is high as to whether he makes it beyond July. But the cyclical fortune of recycled men are known only to Steinbrenner's exclusive friends. So don't be surprised if you wake up and find he's hired back Yogi Berra again. The Ralph touches the wood and subverts the mark of the mark. The love of the world is love. The house of the Michael and then the Bob Lemon again. To Gene Michael again. To Clyde King. To Billy Martin again. Again to Yogi Berra again. Back to Martin again. 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 Maybe a tune Yankee fans are tiring of. Before we end our pregame show and go on to the game, we uh, want to take a moment to remember Frank Lieber, a sportscaster for 22 years with CBS Sports, who died of a heart attack this past Wednesday. Frank, his wife Kathy, and his five children lived in Dallas, where I knew him, and I was among the many whom he helped with his generosity and kindness. For those who knew him through his work, his professionalism and contribution to sports will be missed. For those of us lucky enough to know him personally, Frank will miss you.